everybody. Welcome back to Sustainable Design Masterclass. Uh, I'm really excited today to have Richard Perkins on. Richard first came onto my radar, I think, four or five years ago when uh, I was just kind of getting started out and I was part of some Facebook groups. And every now and then Richard would uh, pop up on these different groups and he'd be teaching, you know, in all sorts of different places. Uh, and I thought it was super cool. And then um, when I was in the States earlier this year, I got to flip through his book, which is Making Small Farms Work, and I was super impressed. Uh, this is a really useful book if you're into small farming, and I was like, we got to get this guy on our show. So today was the day we could make it happen. I'm really excited to hear Richard's story and learn from him. And uh, welcome. Thanks for your time. Thanks for being with us. And Richard, you take it away. Great. Thanks so much. And yeah, it's an honor to be with you guys. Thanks for your work putting these things together. And hey to everyone, it's, it's quite unusual for me to speak to an audience I can't see. I'm used to doing quite intensive face-to-face -face things here, but it's great to be able to connect across the oceans and use this technology in a beneficial way. Uh, so yeah, I was thinking I'd get started and just show you through what we've been up to at our farm and the approach and strategies that we're working with and show you some of the enterprises that we've started out with and then hopefully end up by getting into some of the numbers and looking at like, yeah, answering the question, can we make this stuff work? I think it's uh, an important, a very important part of it and a big question for a lot of people. So hopefully we'll get into that and have some time for questions and answers afterwards. Uh, we've been having a little bit of technological problems, so I'm going to try and just launch this slideshow. Maybe you guys can let me know if it's working as it should do. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks for bearing with that. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about what we're up to. This is our farm. We're up in Sweden at 59 degrees north. Uh, it's sort of similar climate analogs to some of you over there in the States, but a little bit different. I mean, we're very far north in comparison. We're up at, I guess, same latitude as Magadan at the end of the Road of Bones in, in Russia and uh, Fritz Creek in Alaska. And so we have very low daylight length and sun intensity and total accumulated heat. So it's quite a challenging place to set up a farm. We have about 120 days without frost, uh, give or take 15 to 20 days each year. It's, it's quite variable weather when we're up at these extremes. We do benefit from the Gulf Stream, obviously, and we wouldn't be here if it, if it wasn't for that. And yeah, I'm really interested in how we move the permaculture space and scale it up to the farm scale, because a lot of people have come into the permaculture space through um, looking at self-sustainability, garden scale stuff, and there's a huge amount of information and literature and things about that. But there's very little examples of working farms, particularly in Europe, and I'm guessing it's the same over there in the States too. And there's various reasons for that, and it's certainly not easy to make a living farming in a way that goes really against the grain to how modern agriculture works. But it's it is possible, and you know, if you're really choosing that lifestyle, I think there are opportunities today that didn't exist not very long ago. So I want to share some of the approaches and strategies to design that, that we've applied here and get into some of the, the details of that. And I think it's quite, you know, farming, agriculture as a, a way of life is so distinctly different from um, producing for your own needs. It's relatively much simpler to produce enough food for, to supply a family's needs, for example. Uh, but as soon as you start producing for a living, you are dealing with the economy, uh, which just suddenly takes things to a totally different level. And then you've got to work within regulatory, regulatory frameworks, which makes it very challenging at times, particularly as regulations tend to be written in favor and towards industry. So it can make it very hard to navigate these ways. I think for all of us that are pioneering alternative and new ways of doing things, there's a lot of hurdles we have to clear that then progressively make it easier for other people to to take those things on too if it, if it fits their context. And 
interestingly for me, I mean, agriculture, my journey with agriculture started at the age of 18. I went to organic uh, ag school to do crop production in the UK. And it was kind of disappointing for me. I left with more questions than answers, and I feel like so much of organic agriculture, mainstream organic agriculture, is based around soil depleting methods, and I really left there feeling like there must be different ways to do this, and I've had a very long roundabout journey since then, ending up here, and got very interested in uh, annual crop production, worked on a lot of farms, uh, looking at CSAs and annual production. Uh, but there, again, I saw a lot of soil depleting methods and, and just felt like there must be people doing interesting things in other parts of the world. So I traveled a lot and I, I had the real uh, honor to work in many different climate zones in the tropics and in the Mediterranean and in the cool and cold temperate climates. And it really taught me a lot about my own uh, climatic zone to really study how ecology functions differently in different climates. And, um, yeah, I found that a really beneficial part of my uh, learning journey, as it were. But I saw in that process for myself that there's very few places for people to go to really learn in depth, hands on, tangible sort of feeling of how to go about running these kind of alternatives. I mean, you can't learn this stuff at ag school. All of the people that are pioneering these alternative ways of production are, are out there on the limb doing it and often super busy people. So when we set up this farm, we wanted it to be a working farm, but we also wanted to use the opportunity to create the kind of learning opportunities that I wish I'd found on, on my journey. Um, and yeah, it's been a, we just finished our third season. And it's been a very intense ride so far. We've done a lot of stuff in a short time. And that's kind of the, the way that farming has to work here. We have five months, six months to produce all of our year's needs. And then a long winter to rest and recuperate. And it's kind of how the seasons work here up at this high latitude. The sun doesn't really go down until late at night. So we typically work very long hours in the summer. And then winter's just kind of dark, so we, we rest a lot. But I think it's an important thing. I mean, civilization, as we know, is based upon agriculture, and it's something we do so poorly today. And, you know, we're sitting here able to listen to this webinar because we rely fundamentally on someone else producing agricultural products for us. And I think it's, you know, it's a major missing link in all of this uh, in the permaculture space in this field really because there's so little documented studies of, of working farms and you know farmers still have most of the land under their control other than governments etc so it's it's really the leverage point in my mind and farming used to be the most noble profession on the planet at some point and now has the highest suicide rate of any or one of the highest suicide rates of any profession on the planet so there's a lot of work to be done in this field, and I feel like it's it's something, one of our main uh, occupations here is to really break down some of the idealism that people come into this from, like people coming from the permaculture world wanting to start up productions often need to sort of break down some of the idealistic thinking. You know, on a homestead level, it's very easy to get into like beautiful closed loop systems and when we want to farm for a living we need to drop some of that idealism and get very pragmatic and super diligent in our planning and all of the stuff that makes it work is really the back end, the planning, decision making, financial stuff that, that we get excited to share with people here because that's really what makes it work. So my whole focus is on agricultural design and that's been you know what I've been interested in for many years and have my experience in. And yeah, I want to just show you around the farm to start with and show you what we're up to here. Hey, now it's not letting me click slides. It's, there we go. Is that working? Is anyone, are you able to see the next slide there? Yeah, we can see the next yeah. slide. It's okay. working. Great, thank you. So this is where I'm from, the southwest of England, little village, rural village in the southwest of the UK. and. 
somehow I ended up in this little village in southwestern Sweden. I never really expected to live in a, a colder and more conservative and highly regulated and taxed expensive place in the UK, but I, I did, and I ended up here. And really I just came here in passing to, to run a training, but I saw this incredible opportunity here in Sweden where there's so much land that's not utilized and so many resources, big buildings lying around. And you know, people here have a very high standard of living and it's a very rich country. So, you know, farming for a living is not the most appealing uh, thing for young people, I guess. But it's kind of, it opened my eyes to these opportunities that we couldn't really face in the, in the UK. I mean, access to land is a major problem in Europe. It's very densely populated and land prices often force people out. We have the same situation that you probably have over there in the States where the average age of farmers is you know, up in 60, 65. All of their capital is locked up in, in expensive infrastructure and they can't afford to get out of farming and young people usually don't have money and can't get into it. So it's the same sort of situation there. Um, but seeing these wide open opportunities and I was starting a new relationship at the time, I we started looking around Sweden and ended up at this beautiful property. I would love to tell you the story of how we ended up here because it's a really magical tale that I feel is, is nice to tell because it brings hope to people who you know, sometimes there's this burning passion that people have to get onto land and they just can't see a way to do it because they don't have much finances and etc. And, and that's Tell exactly... The story. So Tell it's the quite story, Richard. Uh, it's a long story, you know. I don't think I will get through all the slides. <laughs> but uh, oh, it's in my... You know, I could tell you another time. But uh, it, it's... Yeah, I, I would love to tell it, but I think there's too many slides to get through. Next webinar. <laughs> okay, so we're up here, Sweden's a very long country and we're up near the Arctic Circle, this reference there just so you can see. And we had about 50 clear criteria for properties and searched all over Sweden. We were looking at the specific Swedish climate zones and distance from international travel. We knew that people would be coming here mainly from abroad and I already had a established education sort of set up and we knew a lot of people would be coming to visit. So we had all these different criteria, and we would overlay them into tools like Google Earth, etc. and narrow down searches for properties. And, and it's interesting because on the inland sea there on the uh, east of Sweden you get quite a warm climate zone all the way right up to the north of the country because it's uh, because of the, the microclimates there. So it really allowed us to break down, uh, using our criteria, break down the, the specific regions of the country that we um, wanted to search in. And we got ourselves a beautiful farm. I'm going to um, just move on here. This is an interesting area, actually, where there was a, a practice by the Finnish. The Finnish bought a, a sort of clear and burning strategy for their farming. They had a rotational farming where they would either ring bark or cut down the forest and let the trees dry and then set fire to them and burn uh, and cultivate rye in the in this sort of ash and nutrient rich uh, remains and then cultivate that to turnip or cabbage and then leave it to pasture for several years and then let it regenerate back to natural forest again and it, was, it took a large area but it seemed like a fairly sustainable way to, to manage the landscape that approach, I believe, was taken over out your way, actually, um, in the 1600s when they established a colony in, uh, in the Delaware River. I think it sort of matched up well with the native approach to using burning, and it was part of the colonization efforts, I believe. So let's just uh, have a look at the farm. It's small farm. I mean, this wouldn't be considered a farm in modern terms. This would usually be a property bought as a second home and the farm just left to pasture and used government subsidies to cut the grass twice a year or something like this. And it's 10 hectares, it's 25 acres and it's the, f the buildings you see in the foreground here and then the fields immediately in the center and a bit of the old forestry up in the top. 
in Sweden, forestry is pretty much all monoculture spruce or pine. I mean, it's not forest, it's more vertical desert, you could say, but it's, it's what most of the country looks like. And yeah, we were looking for a property that had some slope and had potential to be able to be off grid uh, with water, etc. We have a couple of streams that flow through the property that you see there. And we had a, a public road through the middle, which whilst there's only a few little uh, summer houses at the end, it was important for us because that means that the municipality cleared the road for you in the long winter with snow. So that saves us a huge amount of work. And, and it's, it was run by it, it, an old couple owned the farm and they were quite thrifty. They were very well known in the village and they were a self-sustaining sort of couple. They grew wheat many years in a row, horse drawn, and raised pigs and yeah, I don't know fully, but the land had been plowed over many times and so when we got there we, we started, this was actually, I think we bought the farm in November and moved in in early spring 2014. So this is the day that I actually arrived at the farm, I think. Uh, so spring is just about to pop. And something beautiful about this climate zone is that when spring pops, it's almost like the tropics, the rate of growth is explosive and it's always this surprise that, that life can happen again after the, the long winter. And so we set about designing the farm. We did a lot of design work over the winter and a lot of preparations and planning because we knew we were going to hit the ground running and make the most of the, the short season. So you may have seen this if you followed our work, but we wanted to have the long-term approach of the farm based around perennial crops, tree crops and pasture crops that are going to be much more stable in the face of climatic uh, weirding as it is. And we're very interested, in, my design work is very um, influenced by key line design and whilst that's a typically a sort of dry landscape approach to water distribution across landscapes, it has application in our, in our landscapes too. Now we had com heavily compacted land and also wet spots and we live in a climate where people typically drain their landscapes which for me is a symptom of trying to, well it's primarily a symptom of damaging the original ecosystem which naturally evolved with the amount of precipitation landing there or trying to grow something that doesn't want to thrive there. So we take a different approach and we're working to build topsoil and build up thriving habitats. But these are not things that create any quick cash flow. I mean, tree crops here, things take a very long time to establish in our cold climate and there's so little light here that you need some kind of cash flow to get the farm going. So we, we've designed the farm in phases where we're primarily using poultry and other animals and market gardening to cash flow the farm, pay off our debts quite aggressively so that we can start educating customers and moving towards our more ideal values. And that's quite an important point I feel because it's, you know, when you want to make a living you need to start making income immediately from a farm. You can't be investing in this sort of stuff and putting all your money down and having no returns for many years. So we'll get into some of that as we go. But basically we're putting in silver pasture lanes, I'm very interested in agroforestry. I think it's, you know, it's one of the more widely accepted regenerative approaches to uh, arable or pastoral settings that's been, we see it in mainstream farming all over. And I think it's going to be huge in the future. I mean, there's really no reason not to include more trees in our farm landscapes. There's so many benefits if they're designed in intelligently and uh, spaced correctly, etc. We have some old forestry in the north of the property and we're looking to uh, generate revenue out of that in different ways that I'll show you later. Um, and so we've been busy, we put in these systems in the beginning, that landscape now looks like that after three short seasons and our tree crops are establishing and our pastures are radically improving and we're producing a real lot of food actually, mainly based around poultry and our market gardens. 
And a whole lot of people have been learning a lot of stuff about how to do this thing in their context, in their setting. And we've been uh, running some very interesting educational programs to assist with setting this up and, and really leverage the opportunity for learning that comes when you're really starting from scratch. This uh, front yard that looks a bit forlorn here in March is now a thriving market garden and beautiful place to be. And it's really important that aspect of you know creating beautiful aesthetic landscapes to live and work in too. And yeah, we love it here. It's a very beautiful spot we found. So we really see that our foremost responsibility is to regenerate our ecosystem processes here at the farm, build up soil. But we're doing that very specifically with replicable and scalable and profitable farm enterprises because we have this other arm to our work which is to educate and empower other people to go off and do this to themselves. So we're all familiar probably with permaculture principles and all that stuff but there's a few points I would add to that. Of, for me what regenerative agriculture means, you know, by default it must be soil building and you know, there's, that's important to me because even within agricultural circles in organic agriculture circles it's acceptable to have soil loss and for me that's totally unacceptable. Every civilization in history that damaged its topsoil has uh, suffered and disappeared and we're now able to do that faster and faster through the big you know, industrial mechanized approach to ag. But another part of regeneration is not just about the ecosystem, it's got to be about community and economy. It's got to work for farmers and it's got to work for the local customers and, com and community. And they need to feel invited in. Like farms need to be put back into the middle of communities again. Really for me that's the basis of food security, when farmers and customers have relationships. And we can, you know, these things that we have to deal with as Producers are all complex by nature, ecosystems and people and finances, money, they're all complex and change in ways we can't predict. So through the work of people like Alan Savory and holistic management, we now have the decision-making frameworks to deal with that level of complexity. And so that's, um, you know, we're integrating permaculture design primarily with key line design and holistic management and I think these things really meld together perfectly and you know as a for larger landscapes farm scale stuff it's it's totally appropriate to integrate those things I think they all benefit each other hugely and we need to try and always mimic ecosystem processes as far as we can you know as far as possible and that applies to raising animals and understanding animal physiology from tree planting to growing vegetables. Like how do we keep moving towards mimicking how nature does it to reduce the inputs and try and move towards working with local inputs and outputs. Now, you know, you can't really have a highly productive farm without inputs. It's a bit of a myth. It's, it takes a lot of inputs to produce a lot of food but we can certainly work towards localizing them as far as possible. And ideally moving towards farms that take less and less oil, money, technological inputs. You know, we can run a farm without a tractor. We only use a tractor a few hours a year and that saves us a huge amount of money. We don't, you know, we have a small ATV to move all our eggmobiles, etc. So it makes it more affordable and manageable by people uh, on the ground. And we're really into being certified by customers. It's part of that building community. When we have a relationship, we have an open farm gate where our customers are welcome to come and see how we actually produce things. And that word of mouth is our marketing tool. You know, most of our customers are coming to us because they are seeing what their uh, friends and uh, colleagues are buying and they get curious about it and they talk and then they come to an open day and I'm there telling the old ladies about the virtues of grassland farming and they get excited and then they start buying eggs every week and then oh I've got 50 turkeys and they start buying turkeys off us etc. So having customers allowed in it, it means we don't have to pay to be certified organic 
and we do everything organic here. We use organic feeds, etc., and, and usually exceed organic uh, standards. But some organic regulation standards don't make sense to us. Um, for example, the age that a boiler should be slaughtered is just some arbitrary figure that doesn't really bear any uh, relationship to the type of chicken, or you know, it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing. So it allows us more flexibility in our management, which is really key to making it work. Is to have really good planning and be able to flex instantly when you need to. And we're aiming for multi-capital abundance. I'm referencing here the work of Ethan Rowland, Gregory Landau, their, their work with regenerative enterprise. And how do we make businesses where everyone benefits? If everyone's winning at every stage of the game, then everyone wants to keep playing. And it's not just about making a living. Like nobody starts farming to, to get rich. You know, we're certainly not getting rich. I used to earn a lot more money doing what I did before than starting a farm. But I'm becoming rich in, in a lot of other ways that make this you know, a, a wonderful lifestyle that I think others can achieve too. And so yeah, I've talked about we have different tools in our toolkit. We're all pretty familiar with permaculture design. I'm going to move on quite quickly because we have a lot of slides here. I've done a lot of design work in different climates and been engaged in education for a long time. And I love doing that. Like it's you know it's, I really enjoy being able to share uh, my experiences and learning with other people. And then there's two other main legs to the stool, and that's keyline design. And keyline design, the work of Pierre Yeomans has been uh, used in different climates around the world. Now it comes from dryland Australia. And there's different aspects to keyline design that make it hard for some people to grasp. Perhaps uh, it's a whole design sequence in its on its own accord. And that the scale of permanence that you see in the graphic there by Georgie at the bottom is really been the most powerful bit of it for me to give me an organizing framework for applying design on a larger landscape level, an order of prioritization to allow us to lay out farm design based on the geometry of the topography. And it's you know it's something that I just feel is sublime and will always tend towards that. I think some people maybe associate key line design with using a key line plow and, and that's not something I would necessarily do anywhere. But following this scale of permanence as a, an organizing strategy for design work is something I will always do. And if there's an opportunity to lay things out in this graceful patterning, then I will always prioritize that. I think it's, it's definitely been a very important tool in my design work that I'm, yeah, I've based our farm design upon. It, it involves like soil building through uh, subsoil and with a key lime plow and rainwater harvesting, gravity irrigation, etc. That sort of bit of it is not so relevant to us here. We have pretty even uh, rain distribution throughout the year and some would say too much precipitation. So that's not a big part of what we do here. But the scale of permanence as a framework and laying out landscapes according to the pattern of topography uh, are elements that I use in my design work uh, generally regardless. And then the other main arm is holistic management, work of Alan Savory. And we use this for, like again, holistic management is often misunderstood. I guess a lot of people associate or come across holistic management in terms of grazing livestock, but it's primarily a decision-making framework or matrix, as it were. And this, I feel, I mean, a lot of people have been excited by our farm because it's been set up quite fast and efficiently, and, and I would say this is the biggest part of it. It's, you know, we're very clear about our context, what we're trying to do, and that makes decision-making and um, you know some of our biggest decisions have happened extremely quickly and yeah it's a beautiful fluidity once you get super clear about what it is you're shooting for in life the quality of life you're looking for and what you need to do to take responsibility to to get to that and make that available for your kids or grandkids etc it's it's a very potent um starting point i think i feel like this is the starting point that everything else needs to be built upon so it's a big part of what we do. So when we're working here, we're running educational trainings. I mean, we're what I've seen uh, 
we do run like short farm scale permaculture courses, but we also run a two month uh, intensive internship, really getting deep into those subjects, getting into numbers, getting into how to actually lay that stuff out on the ground to really create very rich, tangible experiences for people because it's very rare to find all of these kind of things going on in one place. And to be able to be exposed to them intimately you know, be able to see behind the scenes over an extended period of time. I feel like we've had a lot of people coming here who have, you know, read all the books, seen all these videos, and they're left a little insecure because they're not sure how to apply this. So it's it's something that's been really successful here, I feel like, is really nurturing people through, because everything we're working with is a process. It needs that element of time. I mean, you could read a book about running a pasture boiler enterprise and it's all pretty simple stuff you know laying out key line patterns designing agroforestry systems it's all pretty simple stuff I mean I don't mean that to be uh, condescending I mean if you're not familiar with those things they've, they've come across as overwhelming I guess but design is the relatively simple bit you know making it work on the ground and all the back end stuff decision making and monitoring and being able to respond to what's happening, the details of those things, they can only be learned over time. And so we choose, we don't really accept volunteers here, we have, except for our core team, we have people come for six months and <coughs> we've had incredible people come here and contribute in all kinds of ways and, and really take it on as their own. We've created this, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but there's a beautiful working ethic here where we're all just fully taking responsibility for the things at hand and for each other and creating like a beautiful space for learning. And because we've had quite a big team here, we're able to <coughs> excuse me, to really create the space for people to to really go deep with their learning, to, to leave here with their holistic context clarified, having written their own business plans and to really have a, a lived sense of, hey, yeah, I could do this, I'm going to do this, or that thing's not for me. And I think that's, yeah, it's really valuable. I'm really glad that we've set up in that way because it seems to take people, you know, six, eight weeks to get into the rhythm of this place. I think a lot of people that are excited about this kind of stuff, this way of farming, are coming into it without a farming background. And I think that does make it really challenging. And if that's the case, you need to go and spend some seasons at some good places and really get a hands-on feel for it. Because it's, yeah, it's if you're coming from a farming background, then some of this stuff is quite easy. But I've got this feeling that I'm growing up in a generation of people that are quite soft. Like, we're all quite soft people. You know, our great-grandfathers must have been pretty tough. Like, to live in this environment 100 years ago would have been really hardcore. <laughs> and, you know, the possibility of starving was probably not far around the corner. And I feel like farming is still hard work. You know, there's clever ways to design, you know, more efficient ways to do it. But ultimately, we get up at 6 in the morning and we, we graft very hard all summer. And it's, yeah, it'll always be that way. But we love having people here. Both Johanna and I have traveled extensively for most of our lives. And once you have animals and root yourself in place, it's impossible to do that so easily. So we wanted to be able to bring the world here, as it were. We've had people from over 45 countries coming here. And yeah, it's quite amazing, because we're, we're really in the middle of nowhere, really. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been amazing to have customers come and really get engaged with their food supply. It's, yeah, it's a blessing to be able to share that. So it's all go. It's very busy in the summer and a lot of my time is spent managing people. We're in a transition phase where we're moving over towards moving into like uh, just full employment and less people because I actually just want to farm. <laughs> and then after that busy period of activity, we go into a very long winter. The farm shuts down, it looks like this, for six months. And everything is still, and we get good family time. And that's, you know, there's pros and cons to it, but it's if you're able to generate an income in those six months, you get a really nice long holiday. It's great for pest and disease cycles. We get to 
zoom around on the lake and yeah, great family time, which is really important to us. It's one of the reasons we're setting up a place like this is to create a, a habitat for kids to grow up in. You know, there's there's no more stimulating environment for a kid to grow up in in my mind. So we're, we're perhaps going a bit slower than I thought we might, so let's move forward. I'll just show you quickly through all the different systems of the farm. We're starting with understanding our landform, and then we start designing water systems. And mapping is vital for design, and the technologies for creating mapping, if it's not available readily, is improving dramatically with drones, etc. In Sweden, it's a very affluent nation. We're very lucky. We have laser mapping of the entire country down to 50 centimeter contours. And I've checked these, and they're super accurate. And I think it was 20 bucks to buy this map of the farm, which, you know, simple overlay onto Google Earth. That's all you need to design any level of detail in, in farm planning. There's obviously more technical digital tools, et cetera, that you can use. but Keeping it simple is good if, you know, there's plenty of other things to be doing. And farming, like design in the landscape, is really only about getting down to details of numbers and placements of things so you can get on and actually do it. So our large pattern of water distribution on the land is working with uh, subsoiling our pastures and also putting in trees on this patterning to form the sort of the pattern of the landscape use. And we have a key lime plow up here, and when we went around the farm, when we first moved here, we used the penetrometer, that's the tool in the bottom right there, which measures the pressure you're pushing into the soil. So you can get a, a, a reading of what the soil looks like under the ground. And we, <coughs> we had a plow pan under the ground where the, the horse drawn plow had been pulled, you know, probably for decades. And about 20 three, 24 centimeters deep, and pretty much all the grass roots were within the top 20 centimeters of the soil. So this tool allows us to come along and smash up the ground underneath and allow air and water to infiltrate down into the subsoil, which allows plants to root a bit deeper. They're releasing polysaccharides, life's happening. It's a way of building soil from below without really disturbing the top of the ground. So we work with our interns, teach them how to lay this out accurately on computer systems and then put it out on the ground and, and go and actually implement it. And we combine that with plant grazing. So we, we have a leader follower system here because we're running cows and then sheep and then our poultry. And we're a little bit different to most farms, I guess, in that we kind of shooting first to produce for our own needs and then selling surplus. And when I say our own needs, we're serving 10,000 meals a year out of the farm kitchen. So it's, it's quite a lot of things that we produce just for ourselves. And we serve, you know, the best quality food you can get here. And it's, if we were to buy that in, it would be extremely expensive. So, so far, things like the sheep have been for our own meat supply and our cows are for dairy for the farm. We don't sell these things. And to be honest, on a small scale, you know, herbivores, whilst they're ideal in turning sunlight to valuable food in the most direct way uh, possible, there's, <clears throat> there's no way to make that economic on a, on a small scale. Uh, so it's something we do. So we kind of homestead and then farm uh, for sale too. Uh, but it's kind of a neat little dance around the pasture. We need the cows and sheep to be able to take the grass down to allow us to run the eggmobile so that the poultry netting works. And so we plan the grazing throughout the season to make sure we never overgraze the land. And the ground is improving radically. I mean, the power of chicken is the main culprit. I think, you know, we're bringing in nutrient in that way. And, yeah, the, the scarification and fertilization of, of poultry is such a boost to the nutrient and water cycling and um, it's such a powerful tool that I never really set out to be a chicken farmer but I'm, I'm very excited to be a poultry farmer right now actually. And we do a lot of survey work so in the first year like having people it's 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 a dual-edged thing you know sometimes there are jobs that are great to have lots of people sometimes there are things that take a lot longer because there's people and it's been a blessing, particularly in the first year, to allow us 
to start up slowly and really make surveys. For me, I was moving to a, a climate I wasn't totally familiar with uh, at this far north and hadn't really viewed the property Evelyn for a couple of hours before we bought it. So I really wanted to learn about the species in the pasture and the amount of uh, biomass that grew in the different months and start collecting data. So we do a lot of that and we'll be publishing a lot more of that in the future about how our impact on the land has, has affected it, which looks so far like it's benefiting it hugely. I mean, our, there's areas of our farm that were just moss, and moss is usually a symptom of compaction, waterlogging, acidity, poor fertility, lack of animals, etc., lack of disturbance. And those areas are now thriving grass again, and we've got some of the best grass in the village again now, just after three short seasons, which is fantastic. So that brings us to another part of water is, is being able to move animals around to mimic how animals move in nature is, is having simple reticulated piping around the farm, around every fence line around the farm. We have quick release water points and then we use gas reels that lead to eggmobiles that lead to boiler pens or cows or sheep, etc. So we can literally take water anywhere on the farm. And it's a, a big part of what we're doing here when we're working with folks is trying to get them to see how, like to test themselves, how efficiently can they do this job? If you've got to water the animals or feed the animals three times a day, how do you shave a little minute off those tasks all the time? Because ultimately that's what makes it doable in the end. You know, if you, if you can't keep up the pace, then there's no way to fit everything in. It doesn't matter how big a farm you've got, it's, there's always things that you never get time to get around to. And ultimately, when you start needing to employ people, etc., you need to have benchmarks on those things and achievable targets that you can then lay down so that you can monitor your, your planning, as it were. And then another element of the water design is uh, this year we put in a, a pond. It's a, a bentonite clay line pond that supplies water to the market gardens that we've scaled up now. And we needed an irrigation supply. We only have a very... Uh, low well that we have a extremely good quality water here in Sweden but the well is very shallow and doesn't have the capacity for irrigating during the summer so we did a, a wonderful little process with the interns learning how to do 3D CAD modeling and because we're using a liner we looked at all the alternative ways to lay the liner what was the most efficient way to do this and then they got out there with the laser levels and work with the digger driver to uh, to lay the installation of this that went really sweet. It's within three centimeters accuracy across the, the wall there. It's a, a really nice process to uh, as a learning process. And this is filled from one of our streams. We have a stream dropping out the forest in the background there and fills the pond and overflows back to the stream. And so that supplies our market garden and fill. It refills every 38, 40 hours, so it's ample water to, to keep our market garden supplied. And it also reflects light onto that bank you see, which is a cold climate vineyard, which is five different varieties of cold hardy grapes on alder as a living trellis. And it's just a little pet project of mine to make use of that little microclimate. The sun is arcing and reflecting light onto that bank throughout the entire day with a big hedgerow we planted behind it to trap heat in there. And my aim is to uh, retire when I get my first bottle of vintage. Now. So that's it uh, a few weeks after we put it in and after a month and a half at the end of this year it's healed up very nicely. So that's like our basic water systems and oh, I'd like to ask uh, Neil or Raleigh like what, what time have we got to? Yeah. Let's see. It is about it's 10:50 a.m. over here, but I'm sure if people want to keep hearing your presentation, you know, they would love to keep going. If you're willing to keep going. Can we go? Can we go to like half, uh, 40 more minutes or so? Is that good? 40 40 more minutes on the presentation. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. Like if people feel like they. Yeah, how does everybody feel? Do you want to, like, 
So he can go keep going 40 minutes. Or um, how about this? We can keep going on that. Let's take a 10-minute Q&A break. How does that sound? Good work. It might put me on my flow. All right, never mind. Let's let's keep going then. Well, you could up to you. You can ask some ask some people on the chat there if you like. All right. Once we get going with Q and A, we're not going to stop though. All right. Well, we can only ask five four questions, but I I think to keep this flow going, let's keep the presentation going. Let's let's keep going. Yeah. Everyone says keep going, so we're going to keep going. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I'll 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 speed up some of these so we get through to the end, but. So yeah, woody crops are a really important part of our farm design with many different ways that we integrate uh, different arrangements of tree crops into farm design. And we put in, uh, I'll just run you through some of the main crops that we put in. Tree systems coming from, you know, typically we're planting into um, pasture in a silver arable or silver pasture setting and these are uh, bacterial soils. We need to be looking at how the sort of tree crops we want to plant um, are able to thrive. They're coming from fungal dominated soils usually and forest grown dead forests. So usually that would imply decompacted ground, really carbon rich, and it's really fungi that drive that system. So everything we're doing with our tree planting is prepping the ground to encourage really good root establishment and fungal establishment. We're not looking for trees to get in deep into to growing at that time. Uh, before their roots are established. So our process for our silver pasture lanes has been to pull our key lime plow through as a ripper, which will, you know, essentially break up soil about 70, 75 centimeters down, which is quite a deep hole if you, you know, if you were to try and do that by hand. And then we go over that with a bed former, like a vegetable bed former, which creates a, a really nice tilt. And then we're planting directly over where the shanks of the key lime plow went through the ground to uh, be able to establish trees and have them root really fast. So this was actually the first week that we're at the farm. We laid this, uh, the tree systems in, the main tree systems, and set the pattern of land use across the farm. We're working primarily with these trees as uh, bare root trees. It's the most economical way to buy in plants. And it's assemblies of pear, apple, plum, cherry, Asian pear, a few other things, and um, all the berry fruits, so all the currants and gooseberries and raspberries that do so well here. Um, and everything in the planning process is looking to, to promote the um, establishment of fungi. So things that lead towards that are um, putting fungal foods down, rock dusts and woody biomass. And we actually have a process where we soak the bare root trees as you do before you plant them and we soak them in sugarcane molasses and kelp which are extremely wide in their uh, nutrient spectrum. And that puts this nice sugary solution on the roots and then we'll inoculate that with uh, different mycorrhizal fungi products which you can buy or you can make yourself. And some of those products are shown to increase active root zone by six, seven hundred times in a few weeks, which, you know, they're there in the soil anyway, but they could take many years to form that establishment. So we're just aiming to really set that process off and turn this little island into a sort of fungal community really quickly. We'll uh, top dress that with fungal compost, put some wood chip on there, and because it's been bed formed, we can then seed that with uh, cover crop and things like red clover it's fixing nitrogen for us and also a bit more shifted to the fungal spectrum than something like white clover. So our work there is like just getting the trees to root as quickly as possible and then we have a lovely cycle where our winter bedding for our animals mulches those trees each year. It's, it's really important maybe the first five, six years to really avoid any grass competition with those tree roots. Uh, the two things that will kill trees quickly is competition with grasses and uh, the drying out of roots. So these are systems that we put in and pretty much walked away from and no danger of them drying out. A little pet project of mine is to find nut trees that will uh, do well here. And we've imported uh, some of the hardiest chestnut genetics and different walnuts, pecans, etc. And we're putting them in as a kind of savanna style planting in what we call nut field. 
And again, there's no economic value to this. It's more just my personal little project to see if I can find varieties that will do well here. And these are planted double in the double intensity that you would want them long term because we know some of them will fail. And up to, in this climate, up to about 30% canopy cover, if you were looking down at this, uh, doesn't really affect pasture yield. So there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to put trees into things like pastures or arable cropping situations and only increase the beneficial ecosystem processes going on there. So those trees were established the first sort of couple of months and we put in a windbreak on the south of the farm there. Uh, just as it was put in and those systems are now establishing well and giving us quite a lot of fruit still at our own this will be a pick your own eventually we have a lot of customers that are excited to come out to the farm in the summer so this will eventually be a low input uh, help yourself fruit bar and that's that windbreak now at the end of this year these are little cuttings of uh, different salix we put in as a uh, quick growth windbreak as little 30 centimeter cuttings down into rips we made with a key line plow they're now topping six seven meters and this alder that you see me holding on to there is, was put in in about a year and a half ago as a 80 centimeter whip but some of these are topping four meters now and there uh, this is actually where we empty the effluent the wastewater from our poultry processing because you can't obviously put that on edible crops so we're getting our windbreaks in and it was very important to us to put tree systems in immediately really because they take a long time to grow here and you know it's uh, yeah it's great to start seeing that we're already getting some of the protection and uh, wind buffering from that already which is particularly important for our orchard crops you know we get a lot of storm winds and we're in a little valley situation with uh, ridges on each side of us that sometimes funnel storms up into the farm and that's the problem with uh, orchard crops for blowing off your blossom, etc. This year we've added to the tree systems and used the key lime plow as a ripper again with the coulters to, to cut little uh, slits that have allowed us to do a really quick install of uh, geotextile to put in more nut trees. Uh, it's up in the, this is up in uh, what we call top field. And we decided to use geotextiles here because they're very low maintenance. Uh, we didn't want any more uh, maintenance to do on tree systems, and they're very long-term trees that, uh, yeah, we just want to walk away from really. And it's you see here the it's one of the beauties of laying things out on this key line patterning is everything works parallel or uh, equidistant, these rows are equidistant which means it just works so beautifully with fixed width machinery or animal pens, animal fencing etc. It makes it really easy to calculate daily grazing moves etc. It's, it's just a really nice aesthetically pleasing and highly functional way to lay out farm systems. Typically in our climate here in Europe in the cool and cold temper climates, these silver pasture lanes, you want them, you know, anywhere 8 to 24, 26 meters spacing between the rows is where you get the optimal beneficial uh, relationships between the tree crops and the pasture or arable crops. Beyond that, those interactions kind of tailor off. And for me, I'm just, you know, this landscape uh, is going to get really... Uh, very sheltered, very, it's going to look very different in years to come. There's avenue plantings along the roads and I'm always thinking where I can add more trees actually. It's, it's such a, yeah, it's a big part of the future of agriculture for sure. These uh, systems are protected by fencing. We have uh, a lot of deer and elk, what you call uh, moose I guess. Uh, we have a lot of pressure from them and they will go well out their way to eat uh, fruit trees, particularly apple trees. They'll take the buds off and the fruit. And we also have uh, wolves and um, potentially lynx, but mostly wolves. We have about five wolves that live in the forest behind us at the top of the hill there. And so you have uh, quite an extensive fence. It's about two meters tall, so deer could travel over it, but they just wouldn't. And I have no uh, sleep this night's worrying about that. 
and there's a couple of strands of 10,000 volts at the top there, which is in theory for links, uh, but probably more for the elk and deer. And then a lower internal wire, which uh, is electrified, is for the um, wolves. They'll stick their nose through first. And we primarily put that up. I mean, once you have livestock, you obviously need to protect your livestock, but also protect other people's property if your livestock uh, have any tendency to escape. But it's also mainly to protect our tree crops because there's a lot of value and it's a long time to establish those. So that's quite an important part of designing the farm and the cash investments in the beginning that is often overlooked. But then internally, we run all the animals through different nets and reel systems and highly portable solar powered setups, really easy to work with. And animals are constantly on the move there. That's the uh, cold climate vineyard I was telling you about. And uh, here's some other tree crops. We put in some hops for our local brewer. And uh, local is a much bigger marketing tool than organic here in Sweden. It means a lot more to a lot more people, it seems. And he invested in a, a bunch of hop plants for us, and we put them on the edge of our riparian. These are there's three varieties that are good for beer making that can grow here. It's we don't have any of the short strain cultivars like you have over in the states. We only have the tall ones. So next spring we'll be putting in uh, six meter poles and wires, and it's quite an interesting one. I mean, he's basically bought the plants. We're doing the work to look after them, harvest them, etc. And he he guarantees to buy anything we can get because it just does his marketing for him if he's got local hops. But that's a fifteen thousand dollar crop with three hundred and fifty plants in a good year, and it doesn't take up any space that we were using anyway, and it's very low input. So quite neat. He also brings us his spent grain, which we then feed our pigs as a supplemental feed for our, our pigs that we've started up as an enterprise here. And we have some different things going on with woody crops. This is uh, what we call our medicine cabinet. It's a um, it's like a berry, superfruit, uh, tonicy sort of planting in a very marginal area of the farm that is for us to make. Um, you know, high nutrient dense pre winter medicine sort of foods before the long winter here where you don't get much sunlight and you don't get uh, much fresh vitamins, etc. And then this is uh, and something that's always on my mind most of Sweden looks like this, or in its other phase, this uh, clear cut, you know, monocultural uh, vertical deserts. And it's a very big business here. and. Yeah, we have a couple of hectares of, of spruce ready to plant, but what I've been doing is uh, running pigs through the cut forest. This is Nicholas here, who's been uh, one of the main, he's been my right-hand man, actually. He's been here every year that the farms run. And we started running our pigs through here. And we're looking at ways to regenerate the forest and still extract some value out of it because there's got to be other ways than clear cuts. You have really major problems with uh, hydrological cycles when they do big scale clear cutting here, which they're doing on you know, hundreds of hectares around us over the next few years. It's going to be quite bad. But what I noticed is that the trees that are coming back are all oak and ash and lime and hazel and rowan and these are all beautiful woods I mean uh, I don't really know what you're meant to do with a spruce tree to be honest but I'd much rather have these other these other species there so we're um, we're doing a few things and we're not fully sure where we're going but we're going to fence up these paddocks permanently in the spring I think uh, and start up our pig enterprise and we have enough space to be able to run uh, probably 50 piglets through and raise them up. And these are Linderud. It's the only Swedish sort of heirloom pig. And there's a huge demand for high quality, you know, well raised pigs here. And the day we bought these initial pigs to the farm, we had people phoning up from Stockholm wanting to eat them already. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's it's going to be a good one. We're exploring what it takes, you know, where a balance point for this enterprise will be where we don't have any feed inputs. So we're using the spent brewer's grain and waste from uh, supermarkets, etc., and from the garden in the summer. 
And that's quite an interesting thing to, to play with. You know, it can be a lot more profitable to not produce very many and not actually have to pay the fee to be. So that's kind of neat. And they're turning the ground up, and it's opening up ground for <coughs> one thing I didn't say is when we've passed the pigs through here, and then that ground goes through its little process of succession. The, the species that come back underneath all those young trees, they're not really taking out the, the young trees, but that's a function of time. You know, if you left them too long, they would. But we have enough space that we wouldn't need to have them disturb the trees that are, are establishing there. But the species coming back underneath change to the sort of species assemblies you see in the pasture. So it opens up all this ground for grazing. You know, it's perfect ground for sheep and, and our cows, which are also mountain cattle that, you know, are bred for that kind of poor scrubby land that they used to get thrown out on. We've also been playing around with, like, here's back in some of our older woodland, and I think there's about $15,000 of value in that timber if they came as a company and you know clear cut it and took it away and when you do the maths it's about a million dollars of timber when they turn it into planks and sell it and so it's a very poor per meter return you know it's a 70 80 90 year crop rotation and we're just exploring ways we get a lot of free timber this is a house made out of scrap up our trees that if we hire this out for a month a year and feed people awesome food, you know, someone coming from Stockholm, having a romantic getaway for the weekend, and swimming in the lake, eating awesome food, meeting interesting people. It's a neat thing, and it's more profitable to rent this out for one month a year than it is to cut that forest down at all. So we're looking at using that forest over the rest of our lives to supply our timber needs with some simple sawmill, and thinning it in a way that really allows the natural regeneration to and turn it back into a forest that I would, you know, more natural forest assembly that I would love to leave my kids with. Uh, I'm going to move on from talking about that. We're very interested in um, using timber for composting, but that's another story. So I want to look at some of our enterprises. So to cash flow all this stuff, to get it going, uh, we've been mainly focused on plastic boilers and layers and our market gardens. So I'm, I want to just run through those things quickly. Um, we build a slaughtery on the farm because that's one of the best ways to be able to, to get the value out of what you know the work you're doing. We have a winter space for the animals, and we do deep litter system, and then in the spring we clear that out, mulch all our tree systems with it, and bring in uh, bedding, and do a new deep litter system for the for the broilers. And um, we're doing, we did 3,000 this year. And on a small farm like this, under the legislation here, you can do up to 10,000. And that's still classed as zero production. And I don't quite understand what that means. It's a lot of chickens. And, you know, that's a $120,000 profit enterprise if you could be bothered to uh, slaughter that many chickens, which I don't think we'll ever do. But uh, here you see Mikkel and Sarah, they're two of our awesome farm managers this year, amazing folks, and they're doing salmonella testing. We have to do salmonella testing for every batch of poultry. And we're, you know, very inspired by the Salton model. We've just adapted that to fit our climatic uh, factors here, and it works very nicely as a fertilization method. So it's, you know, there's a lot of flaws with this um, uh, enterprise. You know, it's based on industry. It's based on grain imported in, but I'm much happier importing grain and putting it through something that earns me money to fertilize my soil and get my pasture going again and give me time to build up a relationship with customers to then move towards something more truly pasture-based. Uh, you know, it would be great to be able to sell a thousand geese a year, but to be honest, people here don't eat geese. And, you know, it would be naive to start out with that idealism. We need to, the way I see it is you need to get in the game and become a price setter. You know, we're able to command the same prices as organic certified produce without being certified organic, even though we're, you know, we're only using organic feeds, etc. Until you get established in that, you can't really become a trendsetter, you know. 
there are people asking us for ducks and some restaurants asking us for pigeons, but it's got to be built up to a level that's economically viable. And this is a great enterprise in my mind to get going because it really increases soil fertility and our grass is just amazing what the chickens have done to our grassland in such a short time. It's very easy to do, you know, anyone, I can show someone how to do this enterprise in a month and they know all the nuts and bolts of it. So it's a good gateway in, you know, you can do this on rented land, you can build a slaughtery pretty simply. I mean, it's, you know, it was a challenging when we did it because we couldn't understand what the regulations meant, but it's actually quite straightforward. And, yeah, it's anyone can work with it, you know, nothing's out of reach for anyone. It's it's easy to deal with poultry. So whilst it's flawed, you know, it's a great starting point and then our slaughtery facility can be used to process things like turkeys and geese and you know other small animals, possibly rabbits, etc. That's how we run the farm using a just a simple ATV that we use for moving eggmobiles, moving things around, etc. Much more fuel efficient and very happy with this machine. It's a super nice machine. And this is the process of starting uh, building our slaughtery. So this is an old workers' cabin that we bought for $200, and you know it was a little bit rough shape on the outside, but nothing wrong with it. Already waterproofed on the floor, and we just set about a few of us who had no experience of how to build a slaughtery, and we just, you know, none of us actually could read the Swedish regulations either. <laughs> but, we set about it, we PVC the whole thing, put in machines, tools, everything second hand. It's now one of you know Europe's cheapest approved uh, slaughtering facilities and looks a bit more like this on the outside. And in the photo there you have a concrete pad, that's the, the kill station. There's a tent that pops up there. Uh, we have time for 18 slaughter sessions as it were in, through the season. So. It's, you know, we have a, about a 125 day season as it were. And then birds pass in, it looks like this on the inside. There was an old guy who used to have a turkey farm nearby, so we bought his old turkey plucker and recycled bits of stainless steel we found lying around in dumps, etc. And simple water collection system that goes back onto the land from the wastewater, composting of offals. And it's, uh, it's a really nice space actually to, you know, if you've seen the Salatin model and been inspired by that, maybe you can set up like that. It would be way cheaper, way quicker, way easier, but it wouldn't meet regulations here. And actually I really love this because you walk in from your farm clothes and you get changed and you're in this space, you're in a clean space that's sterile, it's hygienic and it feels really great, you know, it feels like such a nice part of the working week for me actually. And we're producing a really neat product, you know, it's it's got its flaws, but you can't buy Sweden, in Sweden, you can't buy chicken and, as good as this anyway. And we started this up, like we're very interested in finding super efficient ways to sell products too. And Johanna's just done an amazing job with uh, customer relating and building up very efficient sales network. This is a farm currency that we developed, it's called a Ridge Dollar, and it's a kind of play on the farm's name, but also the original Swedish currency. And it's uh, it's like a CSA sort of setup, it's a way of selling a chicken up front. And we one Ridge Dollar costs 20 bucks, and that buys you two kilos of chicken. And then the chickens come out 2.2, 2.4 kilos, and the customers will pay us cash in return. So everything we've done here we try to sell up front or sell you know create commitments over a certain time period and it's it's really important for a small farm to be able to to get money up front for investments but also to understand your cash flow a bit that's the hardest part of running a small farm is is dealing with the cash flow and then in the bottom now I'm, I'm doing a turkey we've started in turkeys now and we can use that facility for the poultry we have some guinea fowl etc so we can start to cater for more, you know, particular taste. And yeah, that's been going very well. I mean, it's it's a it's a definitely an enterprise worth considering as a startup one because it's something that gives you it can pay us investments in the first year and get you rolling, and it's super crucial to be able to to do that. 
Then we have uh, plastered egg mobiles. We have two. I, I designed one, and then the second season we doubled the, the flock, and I was so happy with the design that I just made it the same. And we did a lot of pasture surveys, and the graph you see there in the bottom left is, uh, yeah, we were looking at the populations of insects in the cow dung. We were interested in the model that Joel Salatin uh, put forth of following eggs behind herbivores, mimicking how birds are always following large herbivores in, in, in the natural systems. And we found that about 96 hours after the herbivores had been through, the level of the uh, the fly larvae was at its highest here, and the uh, dung beetles, which are beneficial, we want them for pulling organic matter down the ground, had disappeared from the pile. So that set the sort of regimen for our, for our leader follower system. And it's amazing, like these chickens just within half an hour of coming out, you can't find a trace of manure, and they're scratching that and distributing manure everywhere, leaving their own manure and scarifying the pasture. And, Every year when we bring the, the eggmobiles out, the neighbor brings out a harrow, drives around the field three or four times with a harrow, and then drives around with fertilizer, and just spend a bunch of money in diesel to grow grass with chemical to sell hay. It's not really worth a lot. It, it doesn't seem like a, a, a smart idea in my mind. We bring these chickens out. They do exactly the same job, and they produce 18, 20 thousand dollars of eggs a year for us. And again, it's a low startup cost thing. You know, I built these out of old caravan trailers, old car trailers, scrap wood that we get from the timber yard. And uh, we made a design for rollaway nest boxes to get clean eggs. You're not allowed to clean eggs here. And it works super nice, you know, so to $1,500 to build this eggmobile and get going with the enterprise. Super happy hens, super good eggs. Here if you want to sell eggs, if you want to sell off the farm to private customers you can do that, but if you want to sell to restaurants etc you need an egg packery that's certified. Again another way these regulations come in and extra costs and inspections etc. But we got around that with a simple cabin and it got super cheap a few hundred dollars, it's insulated cabin and just turned it into a very simple space. It's got to have water, it's got to have a mouse trap and covered vents and got to monitor the temperature, etc. But there's always like fairly simple ways to go about it. This last year we had the, well, the last couple of seasons we had the hens in the polytunnel. And because we've scaled up the market garden now, we want to be able to grow later and earlier in the season. So we, we're doing the same sort of deep litter setup but in the barn. That uh, that uh, that's wood chip and straw usually that soaks up the manure from the chickens in the deep litter setup, and then we put that on our tree systems to feed the tree systems. So once the trees are established and rooting, all that manure is then fertilizing our tree crops. And it's an awesome little you know it's one of the beauties of a diversified sort of farm is that the inputs and outputs of things start meshing together and giving you a bit more of a closed loop setup. And then that space turns into intensive tomato cucumber uh, growing for our market garden. <coughs> so that's a pond uh, that we built that pumps up the hill there to the market gardens. This is when we first moved in, just laying down rotten manure straight on the ground and actually mulching under the pathways. And We've done some of the best gardens I've ever been to are no-dig gardens. I've been to a couple of astounding gardens built in this way and just added to year on year for you know decades. And they're spongy, bouncy, like old forest floor and super fertile and very disease and pest uh, resistant in that way. And so this is the approach that I wanted to go. We've now scaled up the market gardens to um, to, a, to an enterprise and it went really well. We're scaling that up again to produce, so we were doing 50 shares on 750 square meters. And now we're scaling up to 100 shares. Doing the, um, this no dig approach, which is using some of the sort of innovative modern market garden tools. These are the basic tools that we use. We bring in a lot of compost. We use broad forks. 
rake the bed, roll the bed with a bed roller, and then see the transplant, off we go. And pretty super simple, really, and everything's here in this climate. You need, you know, a lot of row covers. Everything's under row covers in the spring and autumn. And we've got a, about time for 20 shares. I reckon you could push it to 22, but it's a risk. Uh, so 20 weeks of shares. And yeah, it went really well. We've had uh, this was the first year that we we did that this year, and oh, it was really a lot of fun and got me excited about vegetable growing again. This is how I came into all of this stuff in the first place, and I just yeah, I had bad experiences running other people's farms, where I just felt like oh, how can anyone make any money or living doing this? <laughs> But these innovations, particularly all the folks you've got out there in Canada and America doing awesome work, really inspiring, like a new wave of people and doing things in a smart way. We do a lot of preserves that we add to our later boxes and to also feed the family through the winter. And it's all started out, again, like super simple, super low cost. We started all our starts in our living room. This had like uh, 18 of these racks just full. This is like at the end of the season. Our living room was like a humid, uh, <laughs> rotting the bottom corner of the house away. But that's sometimes the way you got to start up, you know. This year we built a, a greenhouse on the side of the house to, to be able to take that out of the house. And that's, you know, it's $1,500. It's built out of Stockholm Police Station bulletproof glass on the roof and free wood that we picked up from the timber yard and we're always trying to make stuff ourselves and not spend money on stuff that we could just make and finding scrap there's so much awesome rubbish here you know it's a benefit of living in a rich country is you get awesome rubbish <laughs> and yeah I'm, I'm flying through because I'm aware that time is uh, a bit away from me so yeah, we've been doing the CSA box, so customers are paying up front for the whole season. And we're doing that with our eggs too. You can subscribe to our eggs for six months, and now we have all our eggs sold for until April, and then we'll actually be getting a, a new flock in. And that's really down to Johanna's awesome planning, but it's so important because it allows us to really get down to the planning and uh, really feel secure in doing this. You know, it's it's farming's high risk as it is. Setting up a diversified farm really fast is really high risk. And you know, I don't know if I'd recommend that to others. You know, you could start in a much slower way. But it, I'm also coming to this with a lot of experience and you know felt confident to do that. So yeah, that's it's down to people's personal thing. But it's it, being able to cultivate customers is awesome. Not just in being able to build that trust that you can receive cash up front for your investments, but also creating uh, buying clubs, which I'll, I'll mention. Uh, we also do a lot of stuff with soil preparations. We make biochars, compost teas, and all different kinds of soil preps, biofertilizers, IMOs, etc., that we um, put on our tree crops, on our veg crops, etc. And I haven't got so much time to mention too much about that. But yeah, cultivating customers. So this is um, something that's key, I think, to get going straight away if you're trying to make a farm work, is to really get in there straight away with setting up things like buying clubs. We used to meet up and sell our pastured eggs in the McDonald's car parks. That was awesome. But uh, yeah, this is down now to half an hour where you know once a week we go to in the winter is much less so in, once a week we go to one town and we turn up for 30 minutes and drop everything off our microgreens eggs etc the next week we go to a different town half an hour there and it's you know in the summer there's more produce and we haven't got it down to half an hour but we will do next summer and all our customers love it because it's really efficient we're always there on time and you know they love having that little interaction but they're also busy people too and they you know they like to turn up say hey say hey to the baby the kids and you know and then go and it wow you know to not have to stand at farmers market to just turn up with a whole van full of chickens and eggs livers and hearts and veg boxes etc just get rid of it and go is you know 
the quicker you get that down, the the more efficient it can run. Because selling is really half of the, the job, and it's it's easy to forget that. You know, a lot of time has been put into cultivating this kind of setup with our customers, and we're trying to work on some more. We haven't got very good software on our on our website for dealing with that. We'd like to develop a system where customers have some options to change because it's you know everyone's busy and goes away for the holiday, etc. And to minimise the, the email back and forth, is customers to be able to design that for themselves so that they can choose and change options here or there, for example. But they're only allowed to change two options in a year or whatever, and just make it like an automated system. So we're going to do some programming over the rest of the winter now. But really key point, I think, is finding efficient ways to sell, trying to get money up front. It's, it's you know, I think it's really key to making it all work. One thing we're doing, I mentioned how we're producing a lot of food for ourselves, but this idea of whole farm, whole menu farming is, you know, one of the beauties of a diverse farm is you know, there are not many farms in our country that eat entire meals only from their farm. You know, most farmers are producing commodities nowadays and often don't even consume the commodity that they produce. And we have these beautiful meals where, it's, you know, homemade cheeses, homegrown vegetables, meats, cured hams, eggs you've just collected from the pasture, and Pates and vegetables. It's it's really you know it's why we're farming is to produce food ultimately, and to have that intimate relationship with the the food we're eating is yeah it's really crucial and I think it's so important for in the context of having a family and bringing up kids. And it's something we delight in here you know to be able to to eat food that you can't buy in a shop. It's yeah it's a real treasure and something that we we love here. Uh, this is our darling chef Elin, who she was a chef here in the first year, and she came. She's been here every year actually, and she's an amazing woman. And she made a beautiful event for our veg box customers, just highlighting all the different ingredients and herbs and flowers and you know different things that they've received throughout the year, and as a way of building community and uh, getting feedback from our customers, etc. And then late in the autumn, it's kind of insane to um, farm even all the wastes, uh, you know, the gluts of food you find in the wild, from fruits to berries and mushrooms, chanterelles and porcini and the fish. We have some of the best Scandinavian salmon fishing just nearby. And yeah, it kind of makes you feel stupid for working so hard as a farmer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, the reason, you know, a major part for me, um, I haven't got to the economy bit yet, but if you keep bearing with me, I want to get to that because I think that's the most important bit. Um, I want to say like a big part of making this happen so quickly has been our ability to intercept waste. You know, it's made us able to set this up on low cost. So here in the top left, here is the first year we arrived. This is Daniel from Australia collecting wood with me, and you know, this is a local sawmill where we turn up to go and buy some timber and then we see stacks. This stack of timber is six meter long lengths, meter no, sorry, six meter long lengths, hundred and fifty odd meter long pile up to four or five meters high. And they're made up of pallets of wood, industrial pallets about the width you see on the trailer there, a meter high, a meter twenty wide. And it, when they fall over, because the industry is run by big machines, they don't have any people, they can't pick it up. So they chuck it in the pile and they chip it and they burn it. So we turn up and we say, hey, we, uh, we can help you out with that. We'll take some of that. We, you know, we have literally built everything out of scrap that we could because we couldn't afford not to. You know, structures, animal shelters, barns, everything. And it's how we've been able to get going really fast on such a low budget. I'm going to show you the, some of the budget figures. I mean, we spent less on this farm than most people spend on a house. And I calculated, actually, to leave the farm, drive 15 kilometers, fill that trailer up, come back to the farm and empty it. If you, if you looked at the face value of that timber, it was the equivalent of getting paid $2 million a year. So then, hey, we're not farming today. We're wood collecting today and tomorrow, 
and the next day we're just going to get wood. What's the point of farming? Let's just get wood. <laughs> we, we, yeah, you know, this barn is eight hundred dollars barn. It's all the roof panels, all the wood is free. And the roof panels are seconds from a company because they had some scratches or something. There was no scratches at all. You know, turning a $200 cabin into a approved slurry, building yurts for a few thousand dollars that, you know, suddenly you can house 50 people. Building eggmobiles and structures and, yeah, just finding ways to, to not spend money on things that you can just make, especially out of other people's trash. Uh, we got these little compost machines, you know, it's thirty-five thousand dollars of composting machine given away by the municipality because they're redoing their housing complex. And you know, we make compost anyway; we don't need them. But when you have a little poultry slaughter facility and you want to compost at the bottom of a field in a pile, that doesn't look good in Swedish regulations. So you know, when you have a shiny machine, it goes, you know. They take that off and it looks great. So it's amazing, you know. There's so much stuff that if you went out to buy, you know, I think we saved at least a hundred, maybe a hundred and fifty thousand dollars on not buying stuff. This is a cabin that we swapped for four chickens. You know, these these cost two and a half, three, four thousand dollars if you go out buy them. It's been an intern wagon. Now it's going to become a, an awesome sauna that we can take off road down to the lake and. Here's more wood and converting, you know, 150 square meter barn for free. You know, it's it's crazy. This is the wood that built our tree house and our greenhouse. It's, you know, it's, yeah. I wish I had half a day free every day to go and find other people's waste. Now, I want to quickly move to the last bit of it, which is to look at some numbers, but it's maybe, you know, a 10, 15 minute segment there. I just mentioned quickly, like at the same time as we're doing all this stuff, we've been building up our sheep flock. We currently have about 35 ewes that we're building up to maybe 40. And we'll be selling lamb in half lambs, whole lambs. We have five cows, but they're just for our own needs. They're not a, you know, part of an enterprise. And we've been working with turkeys. And uh, we've started with the Lindwood pigs in the forest, which is, I think it's going to be a really neat one. And we're playing around with microgreens to create some kind of winter produce that, you know, everything shuts down in winter. We still have the eggs, obviously, but uh, oven and frozen meats, etc. There's there's not much fresh out there, and everyone here imports all that sort of stuff from Israel, etc. So I want to get down to some numbers, and you know, I've thought long and hard about this. I'm sorry if, if this is going to go on too long for people. I apologize. I'm totally... Um, I want to get into this bit. I feel like it's the most important bit. Um, so if you've got time, that's that's great with me. Maybe the others can um, let me know if it's going to go on too long. But maybe like for 15 more minutes. Um, Keep going. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> I'm happy with your permission. I yeah, this is really important stuff, and I I have thought a lot about how to do this because me just publicising my personal finances is, I don't feel is of most benefit because I feel we have incomes from things that aren't the farm and we have incomes for, like for selling my book and we have incomes from training for example like other business on the farm and I can't imagine there's many people excited to set up a farm and set up a full-time education center at the same time you'd have to be a little bit crazy to do that I think so I don't, yeah, what I want to do to look at this question of can we make these farms work is I want to just look at the numbers we've worked with, you know, in our investments, what we've spent and what it's cost us, and I want to look at the enterprise numbers. So I'm cutting out all of our other incomes, and let's get into that. It brings up a lot of contextual things, and I think the first thing I'd like to say is that, um, you know, we've seen a lot of this marketing of like gross incomes you know you can earn X amount on X amount of land and obviously that's good marketing it's a lot better marketing than hey in the end if I do all the costs and pay my taxes I get a mediocre income for working real hard you know 
it doesn't sound so good in the marketing. So, you know, I understand where it comes from, but I feel like it's really misleading. And I feel like it's also, it's a real challenge how to share that kind of stuff because, you know, it's so tied up in context, you know. I can move an egg mobile in 20 minutes, but I've also watched five people take 45 minutes to do. So I know what I can do in a year. I don't know what you can do in a year. Only you know that. And if you're coming into this new to farming, then, you know, the learning curve is going to be very steep. And I really highly suggest you spend two, three, four seasons at other people's places, grafting, learning the ropes, you know, with your hands, taking it on, offering to take responsibility and putting yourself in the, in the hot seat, as it were, because it's, it's tough. It's not easy to make it work. It is doable. We are making it work, but we work really hard. We plan really well, and we, you know, we're pretty on it, and we're doing it in a position where, you know, we're coming into this without uh, land, without inheritance. We started with $20,000 in our pockets and took loans and didn't get into massive debt that we couldn't afford, which is important. Uh, so yeah, for context, I'm, I'm, I've turned all this into dollars. I'm using our enterprise figures. I'm using our real investment costs, etc. I've taken away other incomes we have, and I'll try and explain. I really want to present this in a balanced view, and I, I, I'll try and do that. But I, I expect they will bring up a lot of questions and stuff. So, so let's go into that. I won't let me go into that. Yes, I'm so, numbers. It's this farm. It cost us about a, just over a hundred thousand dollars in the purchasing of the farm. It would have been seen as a very low standard, uh, like the level of housing. I think the house is valued at thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars. It's you know, it's not well insulated. It's seen as very low standard. For us, we've lived. You know, I've lived low impact half my life. So it was like three times more rooms than I could ever use anyway. And, you know, it's a low standard, so, you know, a typical Swede would probably have ripped the house down, built a new house, and not really utilize the land. So it's kind of cheap in, in, in one way. It's also a lot of money if you don't have it, I guess. Uh, since then, we've invested slightly more than that in establishing all these enterprises. And that's the enterprises I've been telling you about, the main ones we've set up but also longer term investments that are kind of split between those enterprises like perimeter fencing and buying in the sheep, the cows, the pigs, uh, delivery vehicle, buying the rhino, the ATV, so putting in the tree systems, buying trailers, other basic infrastructure, tools, etc. Da, da, da. Um, and I figure that the running costs, uh, the way I'm going to present this is the figures I'm going to show you are from very big complex enterprise spreadsheets that we have for each enterprise that account for the running costs of the enterprises. So what I've done is I've split up the investments and I'm going to show what it would look like to, we want to pay off all our investments in five years and we want to pay off our farm in ten years if we can't pay it off in five years too. So what I've done is I've taken the uh, investment costs for the enterprises and put them into that $106,000 you see there. But the running costs of all the enterprises are already factored into the figures that we'll see shortly of the enterprises. Right? Uh, so the basic running costs outside of enterprises are things like for accounting software, and bookkeeping, office material, phones, internet, electricity, fuel, vehicles, insurance, controls. You know, we have a lot of controls. And as soon as you want to serve someone uh, a cup of tea here, it's $3,000 of water testing to make sure the water is safe. We have some of the best water in the world here, by the way. So it's kind of like this. So one point, you know, anyone wanting to start up is something I would say is, yeah, if you've got a budget and you're looking for some properties, that don't spend more than 30 or 40 percent of your budget on the property because it costs you way more to do up the property than it does uh, to buy the land. Um, 
that would be my advice. It's very tempting. I oh, I used to go through some of the search engines and what can you get if you put another ten thousand dollars in this search? <laughs> it's so tempting to push your budget, but you can't take on debt you can't afford or you will fail. You know, it's a basic thing. Uh, these are the costs in U.S. dollars of the actual setup of our enterprises. And for the pasture boilers, that's to build our slaughtery and all the gear in there to put in chillers. Cool boxes for transportation, transport crates, waterers, feeders, building the pans, trailers for wastewater, etc. And that's that's pretty low cost to build an approved slaughter and all that stuff. But again, it's because we've been very resourceful. You know, if you can build an outdoor field slaughter thing, then wow, you can set up real cheap. And pasture layers are pretty cheap to build. You know, we built the egg mobiles and nest boxes and the egg packery was cheap. Just need some fences, energizers, and off you go. That's a very cheap enterprise to set up. And these are all things that can pay off that investment, you know, in their first year, which I think is, it's a good aim if you want to be safe. And obviously, in accounting, you have to pay it off maybe over five years. It depends on all that, but yeah. Um, and then the market gardens, that's things like the polytunnel, uh, the greenhouse on the side of the house, and row covers, fleece uh, to put over the beds, the row covers. Wood chips, tools, washing and packing station, which <laughs> for us is super simple, didn't cost so much. Um, putting in the irrigation, so that was expensive. The pond and the irrigation system, a walk in chiller, other gear, packing crates, blah, blah, blah. So $22,000. Um, now, the, each of these enterprises, and we have many more, has these really intense spreadsheets, which you can't probably see any detail in. But just to show you that each of these enterprises, the figures that I'll show you that they produce, have come from very intense spreadsheets. And we spend a lot of time on our spreadsheets, putting in details. All the little orange boxes here are variables that can change at any given moment. And it takes into account taxes, employment, at what ratio, whether we're selling birds wholesale or to private customers, da 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 da. And then we take, you know, we have very detailed records of our, um, when we've slaughtered poultry, we put all the records into that and we get very accurate feed to gain ratios, etc. And we keep feeding that back in. That each year we're just refining this stuff. So these, in fact, uh, these sheets have multiple levels of um, margins built into them. So for the, the broilers, for example, you'd have a margin on how many you expect to die. If 4% die, then write it as 10%. You know. If you think it's going to cost $10,000 to build this thing, write it as $15,000. You know, and we found for most projects here, we're pretty good at planning, but it doesn't matter how well you plan, things cost 20% more than you plan for. You know, oh, another box of screws. Oh, one of those, you know, it's very easy to run them over. So by planning multiple levels, you know, if we get 84% egg laying throughout the whole year, write it as 80 or write it as 75, you know, so that you have this built-in plan. These sheets that we have for each enterprise then all feed into a master sheet and that is broken down to a monthly inflow outflow that gives us the cash flow and cash flow is the hardest thing to manage on the farm. So you really have to get that down and that's one benefit of a long winter is we can really um, <laughs> spend a lot of time looking at spreadsheets. Awesome. But this is really where, you know, this is what makes it work. If you don't have this end in order, you have no idea what's going on with your enterprises. So I want to look at this sheet, and there's a lot of data in here. And I'm going to try and, and break it down. And I'm really sorry. I, I see that uh, most of the people that were online are still there, so I'm, I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, ultimately... I'm putting a shout out and a call out to other people in the field leading the way in these kind of things to start sharing some data around, you know, we've got to get over gross profit stuff because, you know, we can turn over a lot of revenue here and it's very hard to pay employees and take on the salary. 
we're doing it and we can do it but it's hard and it you know it's you've got to give people access to the reality of that which is what we do at the farm it's just very hard to share that on an online medium in a way that makes sense to everyone in the context you know it's yeah I'm reluctant in a way to do this but I, I feel like it's vital so look what I've done here is uh, on the top here do you guys see my mouse pointer Yes, we see it. Cool. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. So look, we got year one to five here, and layers, boilers, market guns. So these are our actual um, figures. I've just translated them to dollars. And let's have a look at what it actually means, right? So here we've got the 700 layers that is each year. Now we sell our layers, we, we buy them at seven and a half dollars as point of lay hence and we sell them at seven and a half dollars whenever we cull them. And people love that as string hens and it's really cheap for a Swedish price. So they you know that bit's kind of taken out of the plan. Um, and that's the revenue of the eggs and the enterprise profit. So the way I've written it here, the enterprise profit is the revenue minus just the enterprise running costs right? and when I total it down at the bottom that's when I take off my investment and my farm running costs etc. So it's a bit funny way to do it but I just felt like this is an interesting way to do it. And then I've written down the summer hours so summer is 180 days for the layers and 185 days in the, the winter you could say and that's to move the eggmobiles and we're moving alternate days one's moving the other's just opening opening feeding collecting eggs feeding shutting them up sorting the eggs packing eggs now the delivery is split the, the time for delivery is split between all three enterprises except in winter when we're laying, we're not selling broilers we're not selling uh, vegetables so I've just split the selling between all the enterprises because we're delivering all of the products at the same time. Um, so in the summer, which is half a year in this case, it totals this many hours. And in the winter, it's nearly the same amount of hours. It's a bit less each day uh, because I'm not moving the eggmobiles. And you need about two and a half hectares of land to run that many hens. Um, broilers were starting year 150 a week, that's for 18 weeks. Uh, it's well, it's for 126 day season and 18 slaughters. So 150 a week, 18 weeks in a row. And then after year three we go up to 180 then 200 a week. And we could do more but I don't know if I would want to, you know. Spending a day in the slaughtery and cleaning up is good enough for me. So that brings in uh, quite a lot of revenue and the enterprise profits quite well. It takes quite a lot of hours. Uh, in the winter it doesn't take any hours and the area needed in hectares is the area you would need to not go over the same ground again, which you could potentially, although that would be down to nitrogen loading regulations that you'd have to look at in your area depends on the age of the bird etc. Market Garden was starting at 50 shares and building up to 100 shares. In our case we're actually going straight to 100 shares next year. That brings in revenue that's quite high profit because we're not using any machinery it's all uh, quite low investment costs and it takes a lot of hours and in the winter it doesn't take any and this is based on the square meter size of the beds. Um, so that's not the space you need, that's the space of the beds you need. Right? Um, some of these things, so I'm basing this model on a couple, right? I'm a, me and my partner are working full time on the farm and we're setting this farm up and we're using employees on top of that. Right? So I'm using the real figures and I'm simulating what it looks like. We do have employees. We've had two employees this year and we're going to have two again next year. But I'm just showing you the numbers, how they relate to only the enterprises. Um, so we've got now down the bottom here, we've got the summer hour total and the winter hour total and the combined revenue. Um, 
but what you see, like in Sweden, taxes are very high, you know. Um, it doesn't leave a lot when you start paying wages and paying yourself. So the combined revenue, one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Well, that's a bunch of money to move through in a six-month period. But then when you take away the farm investments, and that's paying off investment costs in five years, and paying off the property in ten years, uh, it only leaves fifty-three thousand. And then when you pay, so in the first two years, we don't have any employees because we can't afford them. We're hustling. We're starting this thing up. We're paying ourselves as a family one and a half salaries. Now, bear in mind, we have a six-month winter where it only takes two hours a day, two and a half hours a day of work. So we get a very relaxed winter period. Uh, but we can't afford to, you know, we need volunteers. I don't know, like I know some of you over in the States can work with people, um, like in a kind of salad and setup where you pay people stipends. I know some states in the US you can't do that. Here you can't do that. It's against the law. You, um, yeah, you can't do that. So you either, you know, volunteering here is a gray area. So we have to work with the people that come long term, pay a small stipend to cover some of their costs. They're, you know, they're eating gourmet food for six months and we take a small cost, which means they're technically on a low cost uh, education program. But if you've got options to do that, in the beginning you might need to do that. You know, if you haven't got access to people, then you need machines. And machines cost money. So, you know, that's the way it is. I think this is a very real scenario. In the beginning, you're going to be, you know, strapping it a bit. <clears throat> One and a half salaries uh, after tax in Sweden, that would leave like $26,000 for the family after tax. So each salary costs $35,000 to the company. So that leaves the family with just over $26,000 at the end of all that. And technically, that's a living wage in Sweden, but that would be seen as a low wage. But what's interesting is that, you know, we have pretty much all our food supply here. And that's actually enough to pay our property off, pay our private costs, and take it very easy for six months and go off farm for up to a month, hiring someone in to look after the farm. So that's kind of like, you know, maybe these first couple of years you ain't going on holiday. <laughs> you know, it's, you see at the bottom after salaries are paid, so it leaves a thousand bucks, it's not a lot of uh, reserve. Now, there is a lot of built-in reserves in the figures from the enterprises because we're aiming for happy surprises everywhere, you know. But, you know, if I turn around and say, hey, bam, 130 grand in my first year, farming out here doing this cool stuff with my key line plow, and rah, then it looks good. And if I say, hey, I just about, you know, make enough to make a living on, you know, without paying anyone for the first two years, it doesn't sound so good. So, you know, but this is the reality, you know. The fact is we're not making a loss, and that's important. Then as things go on, we start upping the numbers and this is you know once you do once you have a flock of birds to look after it's not much harder to add a few more birds it doesn't take much more work you know. so it's very easy to add on to these enterprises as soon as you you know the reality of keeping livestock is it's 365 days a year seven days a week and yeah that's a, it's a funny thing it's a big part of what we do here is reality checking for people you know like hey do you really want to do this you know are you actually up for that because it's so foreign to you know if you haven't grown up around farming it's yeah you know, it can rock your world a bit like hey no it's up to you like no it's not dinner time it's go and fix the cow fence time and you know that can wake people up a little bit quickly it's you know it's not easy but it's doable here in, the, in year three, we want to take on two people at 50% or one person full time for the summer. Two people for 50% of the time would be better. And that just works out. You know, it leaves a bit more room for play. And then as you scale up a bit more, year four and five, we're taking on two people full time for the summer. Now, 
there's a few contextual points here. One is that if you were just starting out, you wouldn't need to invest, you know, I wouldn't start out doing these three things necessarily all together. It's quite a thin way to spread yourself on the ground. If you've got the experience with those things, like I would be confident to do that, but I wouldn't be planting tree systems and prioritizing all that kind of stuff at the same time. So, you know, I wouldn't have such a lot of investments to pay back because I wouldn't have done a bunch of stuff. You know, you could scale up the market garden to make a family income. You could scale up any of those enterprises too. I think it's very beneficial to have diverse uh, enterprises, but I think it's it's high risk. And if you don't know what you're doing, I wouldn't jump into that because it'll be a nightmare. Um, now, that's based around a couple working a 55-hour week each, but you've got to, you know, in the first few years, you're going to put in 80, 90-hour weeks. I do. I mean, I'm running education as well, but I would be putting that time into the farm if not. I mean, it takes time to get things down. And it's why I really stress this to people coming here is, you know, how do you challenge yourself to move the eggmobile in 20 minutes flat? Because if you can't do that day in, day out, along with all the other things you've got to do that day, there's no way you're going to get down to these figures. You know, that comes by super hard graft and super hard planning. And really making time to monitor plans and tweak them. And that's the beauty of having really good organized sheets. Once you have all that together, if you make time for weekly accounting, etc., it's why I recommend people do their accounts in the beginning, learn how that system works, because it really empowers you on that end of things. You know, if you just offset that to someone else, it saves you a lot of work, but you really aren't in control of the, the enterprise as well. Now, in this scenario I'm presenting here, all these other enterprises are also bringing in income at the same, you know, there's lambs for sale, there's pigs for sale, these are processed off-site and it's very easy to sell them to existing customers who are buying regular products like vegetables or eggs, etc. So in reality there's a bit more leeway there, but again I wouldn't start up with all those enterprises in one go, uh, it, it wouldn't be my advice to most people. Um, but also one, you know, one of the couple doesn't really have anything to do all winter. So if you wanted to pay off the farm and all the investments in five years, you could easily do that by working off farm. Yeah. In our lives, we we don't want to do we don't want that because our contest is creating space for fun in doing that. Um, yeah, I think the other enterprises as they come online, there's probably seventy, eighty-five thousand dollars of enterprise profit as I'm calling it here, from those enterprises. So, you know, that's long term. I think there's enough for four full time salaries year round, but we're only working six months a year mostly. So, you know, it brings scope for not even being here for six months of the year and feeling very confident leaving that with someone. Uh, certainly among the relationships I've been cultivating with, you know, some of the gifted people coming here. So, yeah, you know, and ultimately you don't need to pay these things back in, <laughs> in five years. We are actually aiming for that, but it's, you know, you don't have to necessarily do that. And, yeah, I just, there's a lot of, you know, obviously this is a, a big thing condensed down into a very tight set of data that, you know, I haven't got time to explain how I arrive at all those things. And But I, it is doable. But it's it's hard, you know. We work really hard, and we just about make it through. You know, it, it's not easy to make it plan, but it's doable if you really want that. It's doable. Um, but it's all about planning and planning and planning and putting time into creating the spreadsheets and having someone else look at those spreadsheets. Perhaps, you know, it starts by defining your context. You know. And if you haven't got that clarified in your family, in your business, and that's all you need to do, you know, until that's done, there's there's no next step really. And then, hey, don't go anywhere till you did it, you know. It's super important, I feel like. It makes us fluid in our management in a way that's just joyful. And 
do market research, you know, if you, you need to do your market research to produce things that bring immediate return, but produce things that people are familiar to eat, uh, familiar in eating. You know, people eat eggs every day. People eat chicken regularly in Sweden. If I come along and want to produce pasture geese in my 400 species agroforestry system, you know, it's not going to work in reality. So I think it's really smart to create a lot of time for planning before setting anything up, before acting on the landscape, and then have someone more experienced further down the road and you really look at your plans and ask them to, you know, to rip them apart and have a look at those plans. And try and sell stuff up front. I mean, that's worked extremely well for us, but it's also a risky strategy. I feel like if you, um, you know, people are putting a lot of trust in you to pay you up front for the entire year's vegetables. And if you don't deliver, then, you know, you've lost your customers. So you need to know if you're capable of doing what you're trying to do and that takes experience. If you don't have that experience, I'd say it's a very high risk approach. So but anywhere possible to be able to, you know, find some way to get cash flowing is important. And so finding enterprises that give you cash flow is why I still stand behind broilers. It still fits my context because, you know, Show me the numbers of other enterprises. You know, you can see now, like people ask me a lot, like, you know, why do you do broilers? Why don't you do ducks? And it's like, well, show me the numbers. Show me the numbers. I've done the numbers. They look rubbish right now, you know, because there's only six people that want to buy one. So, you know, it's it's got to be real. It's got to be down to earth. And then once we've got that customer base who know us for that high-quality produce that we consistently give them, then we start educating them, you know, and they're already familiar with their farm. They come each time we do an open day. Then we can start really getting down to like, hey, you know, the benefits of eating pastured rabbits and whatever it is that you're trying to do. I think, it, you know, cash flow is the hardest thing. So enterprises that give you regular cash flow, it's super, super important. I think that getting, you know, don't take on debt you can't afford. You know, it's it's possible to do this on rented land. It's possible to do this as an enterprise behind someone else's existing enterprise if you can frame it right. And find really efficient ways to sell things as quick as you can. And <laughs> put the energy into that. You know, that takes time to build customer relationships, but you need to put that time in at the beginning. And track your time and make notes of how long it takes you to do everything, you know. Here in the summer, you know, it's very easy for someone outside to say, ah, oh, yeah, but you can do that because you have people, but sometimes people take a very long time watching butterflies, counting grass species, you know, and five people went off to collect eggs and didn't come back to the end of the afternoon. I'm just saying, I'm making the point that, you know, if you know how long things take, you can really plan which enterprises bring what kind of income in. You can compare enterprises. You know what you expect from your employees. You can make a plan. It's, you know, it's a function of time and money in this kind of plan. Buy really good tools. Make all your own stuff. You know, Don't buy stuff. Make it. It's way cheaper. It's way more fun. It's super cool making eggmobiles and weird contraptions to open and close things better. And you know, it's fun. It's it's the most stimulating life. It's not an easy life, but it can be done. We are doing it. We love doing it, and you know, we love supporting other people to step into that too, which they're doing. And yeah, what a creative life, you know, living in a place like this with all this beautiful food and creatures around us that we care to make. It's, it's an amazing life and I feel like we need many more people starting farms and starting productions and creating the future we want our kids to grow up. Yeah. But it's got to be fun. If it isn't fun, if it ain't awesome, don't do it. So yeah, thanks so much for your time. I'm, I'm still available for questions. I know I've been really poor in my time planning, but um, yeah, I'm here. If anyone's still here, and I'm, I'm willing to stay with you for a bit. Thanks so Richard, much. You've got a, yay! <laughs> you, we had 150 people show up. We've still got 131 at the okay. end. Um, and uh, 
one of the great things about doing this is I, I reserve the right for myself to ask all the first questions. <laughs> um, what do you see now? You see me. Okay. Sure. Yeah, we can see you and we can see Raleigh. Uh, maybe we should shrink it down to just our faces, yeah. I'm sorry about my time planning, folks. To be honest, I, I didn't actually have so much time to plan because I uh, was taking on a new project that I haven't told you about. <laughs> That's how it goes. <laughs>